Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to be covering some details on implementing low-cost IoT solutions. And the theme around it really today is about that digital transformation that we, we keep hearing. So what I wanted to do was start with a little bit about what digital transformation is, um, some of the benefits and challenges that go along with that, um, then look at some of the Wonderware solution set, which um, I know from the, the feedback we've had from the registrations, that's what people seem to be interested in. Um, and then we can have a, an open Q&A at the end so that um, you can ask any questions as we're, we're going along. Um, so to start with, what is digital transformation? And, and this will actually look different for every organization, um, but generally this is defined as the integration or the implementation of technologies into all areas of the business, which result in how they operate and essentially deliver their value to the customers. If we look beyond that general view, though, um, it's a lot about a cultural change that requires organizations to continually challenge, do lots of experimenting, um, and then get comfortable with failure. Um, because if you want to make these changes in an agile culture, you have to be prepared to fail in some things. Um, this can then sometimes mean walking away from procedures that you've had in the business for a very long time, um, uh, and they've been built up over lots and lots of years in favor of really relatively new practices that are, are still being defined um, as you're going along. So the next question you might ask is, why does all this matter? Um, and the most likely reason that customers look to adopt this kind of thing um, is because they, they have to. The competition has started to do it. We see it all over the place um, so that they can compete in the market, um, and, it, and it's important for you to do that too. One of the reasons is due to the capability and the speed that an organization is changing um, for these forever changing challenges that we're starting to see. Um, and then lastly, how do we really link all this together and how do we make it work? And where this all becomes apparent is really in the, the people, processes, and technology. So changing processes and technology often requires replacing things like paper-based information management and legacy systems with software which provides automation and forces up those processes in line with the improvement targets. The people is arguably the most challenging part of this. Lots of organizations work in pockets of isolation as they have expertise in what their particular role might be um, and lots of knowledge. Um, that means a lot is lost when they leave an organization as an example. It's also important that the people, process, and technology are aligned and this will naturally help the people element, but a fluid environment of knowledge sharing, training, collaboration is key to making that agile culture. So if we look into um, some of the digital transformation benefits, um, and the thing that makes it so important is that the world is going digital. So there's a lot of us out there that are actually unprepared for this. Um, there was a study carried out by the IDT, and they surveyed 81 executives. So 80% of these organizations said that digital, digital transformation was a priority for them, but they actually only had 35% uh, of these, these responses that actually had a clearly defined strategy in place to start to address this need. Study also found that only 17% of people had the skills required to go through this journey. Um, so what we're really referring to here is an awful lot about IT skills um, in the staff that exist in your organization. But when we consider that organizations are still looking at their IT to OT convergence journey, going digital is even harder to achieve in that space. So the big question I presume most of you are asking is, do the benefits of implementing a digital transformation journey outweigh the time and effort needed to complete it? And the short answer is obviously yes, absolutely. Um, what I'm going to do now is just touch on some of the headline benefits that you can achieve improvements in when it comes to looking at a digital, digital transformation for your business. So efficiencies are a huge one, and you probably hear an awful lot of uh, uh, us, and lots of people talk about efficiencies all over your processes, um, departments as an example, and it's about reducing those bottlenecks. So as an example, it could mean that uh, in a lot of environments, we see people waiting for things like reports to come through from the IT teams. Um, these, this is a type of team that will potentially process this type of information, even though the data is local to the plant and nothing is automated in that, that space. 
The good news is digital transformation eliminates many of these bottlenecks when you replace these legacy processes and systems with the automated ones. With a big data trend that has hit over the last few years, you know we've been talking about it for, for many years now, we know that this is only going to get bigger because there's an expectation there that there will be 50 billion connected devices by 2020. So the amount of data that we're going to store in results of this is going to just skyrocket. And we're already starting to see it. Um, it's going to get even bigger. So then from a digital perspective, it's really important that we have the right analytics tools to be able to make sense of that data so we can make those faster, more informed decisions. Going digital means that we can actually reach more people, um, especially through the things like the advancements in mobility and be able to get more of our systems to more of our people. This also extends to being able to provide more capabilities to our customers, and I'll cover a bit more on this later on um, through the solution section. And then from a user experience perspective, we expect the information we want when we want it, and this digital transformation can help with that. Um, what would happen if we couldn't get access to what we wanted in a really simple manner, um, or we had to jump through hoops or experience something which was completely outdated? The likelihood is we'd actually move away or move on to somebody else that could deliver in this way. We're now in a world where this is becoming really important. And then finally, if we can do all of these things, you know, become more efficient, make better decisions, and improve our customer experience, so that we can then get repeat business, it will significantly improve your overall profitability. It's just, a, it's just an obvious, obvious point if we can do all those things. So if we, we look at the challenges, um, and if we um, look at the things that could actually stop us from adopting this digital transformation, then we'll see a resistance to changes, um, certainly an obvious one, um, certainly things like skills gaps, uh, in the market. There's a small number of people in the world who would absolutely love to change, and we we see those um, an awful lot, but the majority see that these changes result in a lot of pain and uncertainty. The truth here is that not changing is far riskier. The problem is that it's much easier to dismiss an idea through a number of ways, things like having to overly justify return on investment um, or prevent cannibalization of other revenue sources. Um, there's two really good examples, and um, there's, there's obviously lots out there, but if we take Blockbuster as an example, um, they didn't actually adapt to the market by moving to any sort of online streaming service, um, and we all know what happened to them. So if we look then on more of a positive side uh, and take somebody like Bell Atlantic in America, they understood their landscape. Uh, they um, instead of providing just a, a landline business and sticking with it, um, because moving outside of that would cannibalize that landline business, they became Verizon. Um, this is now a dominant supplier of a number of common services we see today. So the point here is that Bell Atlantic accepted the change, and they went through the challenges even though there was uncertainty of what the outcome would be. When I say uncertainty, um, that was probably quite early days for them, but we're actually seeing lots of benefits that can be had from implementing a digital transformation strategy already, so that risk is already reduced. There is often a lack of vision um, that we see in organizations, and this has to be defined up front so they understand how to meet their customers' digital needs. Now, some of the other common challenges in here are centered around things like the technology stack, and I'm going to shortly move on to that. Um, and it depends on what you choose. So firstly, it is important that an adequate data collection application is used. Um, it has to be able to deal with the data. It's just a very obvious obvious way. Um, it has to be in the right place. We then need to make sure that data is being stored in um, and viewed by the right analytics packages, which help us to make sense of that data. But it has to be simple. As we're starting to get more and more data, um, we need very um, seamless technology to be able to pull out the information without us having to um, reinvent the wheel or, or, or combine data sources and, and things like that. So what we're now going to do is um, move on to a bit more about the current landscape, so what solutions we provide to, to then help address the challenges that 
that you're seeing and, and help you on your transformation journey. So if you look at the, the landscape, and you may or may not have seen this from a, a recent security presentation that we delivered, um, and, and this was, uh, from a security perspective, obviously uh, very important to, to look at these types of things. Um, in terms of pass, we look at isolated, but as I was starting to put this presentation together, I realized that this also fits very well with the digital transformation landscape. So if you look at past and isolated environments, that actually means that we really struggle to have um, data sharing between the different layers in the Purdue model. Um, isolating um, is a, is a, um, a, a past um, part of the, uh, the way that we used to design systems, mainly from a security perspective, but it actually hinders us from being able to, to, to see the data at a, a lower level and being able to get it out to those enterprise zones. What we're starting to see much more of is this present and structured approach. So we're introducing the right layers in the Purdue model, this conceptual demilitarized zone in the middle, and this allows us to get some um, to and fro in between the, the right layers that we need to. But then if we look at the future, um, and we're looking at all these new devices that are gonna be, become connected um, by 2020, um, really what we should be looking at is an everything connected future. So being able to get data from every space um, and make the right decisions to be able to improve the supply chain, to be able to give better experiences to our customers, um, to be able to tweak our hardware so that it works in the right manner. Um, all this information is key to, to be pulling in and then analyzing to, to be able to make those right decisions. I also took a, an infographic from a, one of the data analysts, analysts called um, Futurum and they said that at the center of this industrial transformation is IoT, uh, and one of the main reasons why you, you've come on this webinar today, uh, and Industry 4.0 uh, goes along, along with that. Um, so what this does is actually it's saying that it count, counts for more than $178 billion in 2016, um, and proving critical to providing companies with a competitive edge. Um, so it's about giving your organizations more. It's about differentiating yourself from the competition um, so that you, you're the guys that can um, really take hold and really make that, that a, a profitable um, um, system for you. There's obviously an awful lot of, of other things that go along with that, um, improved speed and efficiency to come along with um, being able to make those right decisions. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is something that we're starting to hear an awful lot more about. Um, I'll touch on this a little bit later on from a Wonderware standpoint. Um, robotics sitting here. Um, we Again, we're seeing robotics. We see robotics from our Schneider Electric partners um, coming to the forefront. And then that data analytics, which we've been talking about for, for, for a very long time. Um, and they're talking about an, um, an expansion of the amount of data that we're expected to see in the very same way that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I just wanted to, to quickly show you um, the, the Schneider Electric EcoStructure layers. Um, I think it's very, um, very relevant for this topic. Um, so as a Wonderware provider, we sit in that apps, analytics, and services um, element. Uh, they have lots of connected devices, smart devices that sit at that, that bottom layer. These are your, your lower levels. Their edge control, they actually mention as the, the PLCs in the environment because edge control really um, talks to a local real-time real layer that is doing the processing of your information. Um, and Wonderware is no different, um, which I'll come on to shortly, um, but they, they um, say that the PLCs are the, the layer that is actually doing that edge control for them because it's pulling all the data from those connected products at the bottom layer, those sensors, those devices, all those smart products that are coming online doing the analysis of that PLC layer and then providing it up to the right information up to the, the SCADA and apps and analytics at that top layer where we sit. Um, and there's a, there's a good reason. We've been working um, much closer with Schneider Electric recently, oh, in the last couple of years, um, from an industry perspective, because we can um, obviously converge with them to, to, to provide the whole solution um, because they have those, the, those products. And we, we do have an example 
um, of where we've worked really closely with them in a very um, IoT-centric manner, which I'll, I'll talk to later on as well. Um, so from a Wonderware standpoint, one of the first things that we, we need to look at is connections, connections to um, devices, connections to PLCs. You'll know that we've, we've always been PLC agnostic. Um, to get up to our, our SCADA layer, we, we branched out into to much more than that. So we're now operations integration servers, um, connect to any device that you can see out there, things like MQTT. So even really low cost sensors um, that sit on the different networks like LoRa or Sigfox, um, uh, an MQTT stands for message queue telemetry transfer, and it's really like a, um, a really inbuilt battery type sensors that can be mobile, send data back to a, a what's called an MQTT broker, and we read that data from there and pull it into wherever we want to. So the real point about this, even though I'm going to focus on a specific solution um, because it, it sits very nicely with that IoT message, is that IoT is just about getting more data into your system. So if IoT means getting data from smart sensors that sit in the factory, or non-intrusive sensors that sit in the factory because you don't want to have to re-engineer the PLC. Um, we do that. We, we pull it into our historian that sits locally, our, our system platform, our inputs. We present it in, a, in an analy analytics layer, perhaps an intelligence layer, to correlate data between different, different factions. And then, um, and also things like predictive analytics. Um, we need more data to be able to, to, to try and um, predict failures or, or um, set up maintenance routines so that we can predict failures um, and prevent them from occurring. And then everybody thinks IoT automatically um, relates to that online world, which is what I'm going to talk to a bit more shortly. Um, but it doesn't have to. Um, our products are already geared up to be able to, to deliver that at a local level. But similarly, if you want to move that up to the online space, then we certainly move out into that. Um, from an edge control perspective, I mentioned the PLC layer from um, Schneider Electric. The, from a Wonderware standpoint, next year what we're going to start to see is um, like edge control devices or IoT devices, like an IoT gateway. Um, and it works in a very similar principle, um, but really it's centered around the data instead. So from a real-time local perspective, it'll pull the data from the right data sources, and then it will perhaps do calculations at that layer, um, and then send that data to a, a centralized location, probably a cloud-hosted solution um, that will allow you to um, then report on the relevant data to you. Um, and those edge devices will be able to be controlled um, from the cloud as well. So they're not likely to be Windows boxes that you have to maintain because we're, we're constantly looking for easier ways to maintain our systems. We're talking about a really um, low-cost, small device that's perhaps like a Linux device, um, and it works based on firmwares that you don't even see. So we don't have version numbers at this sort of layer. Um, they are updated from a cloud perspective to get the right information we need to be able to make those decisions. So then um, it's worth me just showing a bit about deployment options. And if you look at your existing investments, and this could be um, everything that you've already done just from a, a standard uh, PLC stat layer connecting to the right devices or assets at your plant. Um, and certainly for most of you, moving to the cloud um, doesn't make sense in some regards because we have a system there that runs and you know we don't have to, don't have to fix it um, because it isn't broken. But if you want to become more efficient, perhaps you have to branch out and do a little bit more from there. So perhaps you have to include some more sensors at this local level. So we take resistant investments, and we're not saying rip and replace. We're saying um, add to them and do more with it. And the obvious next step is the online space because, and there's lots of good reasons for that. There's zero management of machines for you. There's um, because somebody else manages all of that. In this case, Schneider Electric. Um, you don't have to worry about things like patch management. Um, you're getting the latest updates to the software all the time automatically because you no longer have to install client tools at a local level. This is all through um, uh, you know, HTML5 web browsers. Um, it's all very seamless in that regard. But the obvious way that we're starting to see this come to the forefront is through a hybrid cloud approach. 
Um, so what that means is taking those existing investments, taking the information that we need, and then publishing just that information to our online solutions. Um, it's not the only use case that we're seeing this in. Um, there's a lot of people see this with stranded assets. It's a fantastic opportunity, the OEM space, um, particularly, especially the people that want to start to add more services to their um, their, their customer base. They want to they want to give something more to their customers by providing an online interface. Um, those stranded assets, it's a it's a really simple way to do that. Um, so that moves us quite nicely onto the online insight solution, which I'm sure you've heard about before. Um, I've only got this one slide on it, and then I'll, I'll show you a very quick demo of something that's just come. Um, the, these are much richer dashboards uh, and trend layouts that are, are seamless, so you don't have to do any sort of programming or scripting to get the level of detail that you can see on the screen in front of you. Um, there's quite the calculations you can do, but rather than having to understand the scripting that goes behind it, you select a different chart type and it will automatically put that on top. What we have seen um, recently is uh, alarm overlays. So if you're using the system platform and you replicate your data to the cloud environment, it will automatically populate your process data and then correlate the alarm situation that happened over the top of it. So it'll tell you how long it was in an alarm state for, who acknowledged it, um, what criticality it was, and we can now even add comments. And that stretches out to the mobile platform, the the, um, the smart glance application, and it's a seamless integration too. Um, I mentioned a little bit before about where we've we've collaborated with Schneider Electric's devices to, to to put this information up here. So what they did was actually get a very low cost um, device that literally just spits out. Um, CSV files, and we've configured it in such a way that um, they can send that data uh, up to the cloud, up to our online environment, it will process it, and then they get all this information in here. But the, the point here is that these low-cost devices are looking at implementing about a 1,000 of these um, over the next so many years, um, but it's, it's just a, a very scalable, very simple approach, and this actually transmits data over um, a 3G uh, connection, so it's over your mobile networks. We're talking small amounts of data, um, but obviously we can get lots of data into CSV files, so we can process an awful lot of it. Um, just very, very, very neat. Um, then I, I wanted to just touch on machine learning um, and some of the complexities that go along with it. So they, from a prerequisites perspective, it's often data scientists that that do this type of machine learning, and they do it against real data, uh, and they have to define what are the normal conditions and what exceptions sit outside of that as to where the problem has occurred. So there's a good example with um, Tesla, the um, car that can drive itself, um, and it was actually in an, an accident, and they have thousands of sensors all over the car, um, so they send data back centrally. And not only does that provide a better user experience, because actually um, they can do things like a, a digital twin. So they can take the data that comes from one car, and perhaps it's a, a creaky door. Um, they can test it in their environment, and then they can roll out a new firmware to the hydraulics in all the cars across all the Tesla range um, so that it, it no longer makes that, that noise. So from a ongoing customer experience perspective, that's, things like that are really important. But when it comes to something like this, this is an anomaly in your normal driving conditions. So yes, they had the data very, very quickly back at their central office, but it took a good few hours of data scientists to, to really work out what had gone on in that scenario, that adverse situation. Um, for most of us, that isn't um, something we have time for, the skills, the expertise. So what we need is something that contains zero configuration um, and what we have inside of online is a simple anomaly detection. So what it'll do is look back over the last couple of uh, weeks of data and it'll look for outliers inside of it. So it sees something that has gone higher than normal, lower than normal, it will highlight that to you so that you can have a look at in, uh, into it in more detail. Um, and it'll do that through, through both platforms. Um, 
Then lastly, what I wanted to show you was a bit about um, how they're extending this and they're constantly updating the online environment to, to be able to provide you with more out of the box. Um, and this really talks to um, having seamless information in context um, for, for, for your customers or for, for yourselves, whichever it may be. Um, so the first way that they branch out into this is providing a simple performance management tool that sits inside of this cloud environment. Um, it's the same environment that we've been using, um, but now what we can do is get some real-time dashboards based on our equipment. So we define our equipment and we have KPIs that then utilize the, the or it shows you the utilization of them, you know, how long they've been running for, the downtime events associated with it. Um, often these types of events tend to be written down somewhere, um, they can be missed, uh, and then we can do some quite clever analysis, and I, I will show you a demo of this shortly. Um, but the, the way that they're doing this is by, again, you've still got this real-time control layer at the bottom, and we're only sending the information we need up to the cloud, so we're going to start to see um, more and more um, services become available in the cloud, but it's going to be this hybrid approach. So we're not cannibalizing anything that sits at that local level, and we're talking about this edge computing um, element to be able to send the right right information. So in terms of the demo, and you guys can all access this, you can sign up and try it for free yourselves if you just go to that URL. Um, so what we have is, uh, this is the home page for it. And if you want to sign up, you just hit the button in the top right, but if you want to just try the data, you can hit try it now and there'll be a whole host of demo data that sits inside of this environment. You can see on their home page we get this anomaly detection down the right, we get some suggested content we've looked at before. I'm not going to go over a whole load of detail with this because we've, we've covered it quite a bit already in the past. Um, but in this menu structure on the left hand side, um, we can now see equipment efficiency. Just select that, and you'll see the equipment that we've defined inside of it, So, um, and then the KPIs that, that go along with it. And at this point in time, this is all a manual um, interface, so if you wanted to configure downtime events, you choose them, you might split them up, um, and then associate downtime reason codes with them. So you can select downtime reason codes based on a set list of them, or um, uh, you can enter your own through like a, another other comment suggestion. Um, so then you can obviously add that into your um, your downtime reasons as you go along. Um, this will be automated by February, so we'll start to take the right information from the plant floor, so it will automatically define these downtime events that occur, and then it's just a case of you going in to, to say what was the reason for that. And then what we can start to do is analyze that, that information, and we can do that through our OE analysis. So this is our report inside of it. Um, we can choose different areas we want to add to the, the list uh, from the right-hand side there. Um, we can separate the areas down the left-hand side here if we want to. And what we can also do then is when we're on the right um, page, we can drill into more information about our specific equipment. In this scenario, we can see we're displaying things like availability percentage, total downtime occurrences. This is the headline figures from a report perspective, but if I drill into one of the pieces of equipment, it will then tell me the top five downtime reasons by count, by duration, um, and then if we can start to knock some of these ones off the top of the list, that will dramatically reduce the amount of downtime that you're having. Um, and then you can um, uh, look at the utilization from the bottom perspective to understand whether you want to look at all of them, whether you want to just look at the downtimes, uh, even if the runtime elements or, or idle states. And we can obviously change the time frames at the bottom to, to display more or less information. Um, so it's, it's quite a simple interface. They're, they're trying to keep things really simple. Um, it's a theme that's been ongoing with Wonderware for quite some time. Um, and I think this just extends out to this. And the automated version of this will, will, will really start to um, help this. But if you're on a fully paper-based system, um, it might be worth just doing like a, a paper on glass type solution from this and we're getting more um, out of our solutions but in that digital way that we, we talked about from the beginning. Okay.
So just to summarise then, um, hopefully you, um, you're all looking at a digital transformation journey at the moment anyway, but if not, then I hope you can see the importance of it, the importance to um, at least look into it and start to move to it. We can see our world going digital and, and we should start to do that in our plant systems. We can now connect to anything, so don't worry about the types of solutions you're putting in there. Um, talk to us and we can tell you how or, or whether we can connect to it, and I'm, I'm pretty certain we'll be able to. And then it's about simplified data in context, so it's about that seamless, very easy to use environment that I've just shown you um, that has given you much more about your data. We're no longer just showing trend lines, we're telling you how long a device has been in a particular state for. Um, or, or perhaps even the, the, the downtime reasons associated with them. I, I touched a little bit on edge computing. Um, we're going to start to see some more of that next year, um, I certainly know. And people refer to edge computing in lots of different ways. As I mentioned, we started with electric and their, their PLCs being that edge computing type layer. And then lastly, I just showed you a bit about where that, that online insight environment is moving to in that performance in the cloud, and it's certainly not a replacement for a full-blown MES system at the bottom layer, um, but it hopefully provides you with at least an interim step or perhaps um, a, a, a full enough solution to be able to get much more out of your environment.